Good day, everyone. My name is Maciej Hirschowski of uh, Red Hat Research, and I'd like to welcome you to yet another Research Days event. This time, I'll start by introducing our conversation lead, who is uh, Zdenek Schwetzer uh, from Red Hat. And now I'll give the word to him and let him introduce our speakers for today. Zdenek, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maciej. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Zdeniek, and I am a project manager at Red Hat. Before I introduce our two uh, presenters, I consider important to provide uh, or mention the context of our collaboration. In the first half of uh, this year, I was tasked to manage a, a project at Red Hat and specifically uh, its goal was to prepare a framework, a set of tools, processes to allow Red Hat to uh, perform a global deployment of, of a new wireless uh, system across all more than 50 offices, uh, which Red Hat has around the globe. I had the pleasure to uh, be asked by the iScorecard uh, folks to, uh, to participate in, in, their, uh, in their case study. They were seeking uh, for another project where they can test and polish their new methodology. Um, I gave them this opportunity and in return, uh, they had a, they had a uh, opportunity to feel the, the project team. And what we gained is the privilege to, to listen to the feedback of uh, of these two academicians. Both presenters are uh, university professors. Uh, Andre is expert on management control and performance measurement. And Eddie acquired uh, roughly 35 years of experience in area of project program and portfolio management uh, by working uh, amongst other countries in, in Middle East, Europe, and even uh, Latin Americas. Uh, I was uh, able to to uh, to feel their their confidence, their oversight uh, during uh, the lifespan of the project. Uh, I had the opportunity to to ask them privately for consultation, and their suggestions enriched both the team and uh, and myself. My today's role is a uh, role of a host. I will uh, be your timekeeper. I will uh, try to articulate your questions as best as I can. Uh, I would like to start with the unnecess unnecessary bits, which is, uh, which is the technicalities around agenda and so forth. This uh, uh, presentation will be split into two sections. Uh, first part uh, will be the theory. We will try to make it as confined as possible, 30 to 40 minutes, after which there will, there will be a 10 minute uh, window for your questions and answers, after which we feel it is right to make a 10 minute coffee break. Second part will be uh, focused on practical applications, uh, after which, again, we will, we will uh, conduct a question uh, uh, and answers session. Please feel free to uh, write down your question whenever uh, it emerges. Use the, use the right uh, part of your screen specifically the tab sessions. Don't use event because event is visible for everybody. I will be only monitoring uh, the sessions bit. I will try to, to uh, uh, to uh, make a note of your, of your question and then uh, whether it will, it is more linked to the theory or to the practice, I will try to articulate it as, uh, as good as I can. I uh, 
feel uh, gratitude for, for the unique opportunity to, to work aside uh, the ice scorecard, ice scorecard team. It is my great pleasure to introduce Andrzej Zizlavski and Eddie Fischer. So thank you, Zdeniak, for introduction. Uh, first, let me note that Eddie and me, we are key members of the Innovation Scorecard team or our Scorecard team. Uh, but we couldn't complete this uh, initiative successfully without help of many other people, such as uh, Maria Ryzniakova, Tanya Spilka, Ludziek Schmidt, Maciej Hrushovsky. Marcel Gazdik was the manager of uh, our second case study. Uh, Zdeniek, you, you were the manager of our last case study in Red Hat. So thank you guys. Thanks a lot for your help and your support. So let's start with the theory. Let's start. So, so tell us guys, how, how did it all start actually? How did short, Zdenek, short or long story? What do you prefer? Story, story is best. No matter <laughs> Stories, you. okay, so let's start. Well, actually, uh, it all started almost 10 years ago. Uh, when I uh, conducted a research in the Czech manufacturing industry uh, between 2014 and 15, and I asked uh, companies who did innovation in that period, uh, if do they measure the innovation, the success or efficiency or performance, no matter how we call it. So if they have a control over the innovation project or not, and if so, if they measure, I was wondering what methods, what metrics do they use? So that was a beginning of, 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 of the old initiative. What I get as a research, as a feedback uh, in 2015, to my surprise was that only one third of all respondents, and the respondents was 350 plus, they measured the efficiency of innovation somehow systematically. And the other surprise, I would say negative, was that they, the majority of them use only financial metrics, such as typically net present value, pay big period, some profitability ratios like a, a return on investment, but they ignored non-financial aspects of innovation such as creativity, communication, team working effort. They had no focus on this part of innovation. Therefore, we identified a gap uh, here in the Czech Republic. And then suddenly we realized that it, it's general problem. It's general issue uh, globally all over the world that there is a missing some simple user-friendly approach to measure the success of innovation. Therefore, based on these, res uh, these results, uh, the innovation scorecard theoretical concept uh, was proposed. The way how to measure innovation, it was published in a book in 2016. But so far, all of this was happening on a theoretical level. And to me, it was tempting to try the innovation scorecard in a practice, in a real life. So therefore I met Eddie, uh, I think it was March 2018, Eddie, uh, we met each other in London. Uh, you can probably imagine typical British spring weather. So it means cold rain, sometimes snow. Uh, but anyway, we met uh, in London. Uh, we had a, yes, we had a few pints of beer, of course. Yeah, <laughs> we discussed my, my inceptions. Uh, to do something practical with the innovation scorecard to, to verify it in a practice to see whether it works or not. And at the end of our meeting, Eddie agreed uh, to become the member of the future uh, I scorecard team. Later on, uh, when I came back to Czech Republic, I applied for a grant provided back by a technology agency of the Czech Republic with a Red Hat and Brno Regional Commercial Chamber as a partners, we got it, and the rest is the history. Now we are here to share our experience with you. 
mentioning you applied for a grant, surely there must be some concept. Uh, so how did you actually arrive at this at this concept of innovation scorecard? Uh, well, by trial and error, I have to say. <laughs> uh, anyway, at the beginning, definitely we had to go through lots of uh, books, articles, publications, just to identify it. If something like innovation scorecard, no matter whether it's called this way or not, if exists. And we realized that no, uh, there are some other theories like a balance scorecard and so on, but there was no concept, no approach, no methodology, simple user friendly to be used in a innovation projects. On the other hand, I have to admit that innovation scorecard, it's not, it's not a groundbreaking theory. It is based on some principles of uh, well-known and respected management techniques, such as balance scorecard, innovation management, project management, some rules how to design uh, performance measurement systems. What is new is the combination of these principles in order to design to create user-friendly tool for measuring the success of innovation. Uh, let's say, for example, I mentioned Balance Scorecard. Balance, Balance Scorecard was a huge source of inspiration for us, but we didn't apply the, in the Balance Scorecards as itself as it is, including four perspectives and some other rules and principles because it's too robust, it's too big. Uh, it works well with a strategy but it doesn't work well with the innovation project. So for example, some bits that we applied in innovation scorecard is the balance between financial and non-financial metrics. Here at this moment, I can say that this principle, well, actually it didn't work in Red Hat. Since the very first case study we did, uh, it was the atomic host and Eddie will talk through it later on there was a significant misbalance between financial and non-financial metrics. What was dominant was non-financial metrics. 90% is non-financial and only one, and probably it was because of me who insisted, okay, so, but we need something like a budget. There must be some money value included in this, uh, in this uh, case study. So that's the misbalance and the same happened in two more case studies. Non-financial metrics are dominant. The other principle, let's say from the balance scorecard is uh, 20 is plenty. The number, the limit for the metrics, uh, the Kaplan and Norton professors from uh, Harvard, one of, in one of their publications, in, in one of their books, they said the rule 20 is plenty or better be less is more. So we decided not to apply, not to implement 20, 50, 100 metrics. That's, it doesn't make sense. We were focused to apply, let's say five metrics, six metric was the maximum for each gate that I will talk later on. So that was another uh, principle and this one worked. So this is, was fine. Uh, the design process, how to design the innovation scorecard was inspired by balance scorecard, of course. And actually the scorecard itself, how it looks like, how we design it in a, in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet uh, was inspired by Balance Scorecard as well. Uh, innovation management, for example, uh, what we took uh, for our innovation scorecard was the current understanding of the innovation pipeline, the innovation process. What is the first, what, what is the next, and how, how it follows. We, we apply the stage gate uh, model, and from general management, uh, we applied input process, output, and result model, which is, uh, I think this is the ISO standard 9001 from 2015, 15, if, I'm, if I'm right. So that's the general management. Project management, uh, we applied some techniques, some tools, uh, that we used in each project uh, that we, as you said, Zdeněk, we polished. Uh, and for example, it was a, uh, the first one was a project definition document, PDD. Uh, the document 
then in a couple of pages, in a high level, it presents the purpose of the project. For the project definition document, we use the approach or principle, which is called Boscart. It was brand new to me. Uh, thanks, Eddie, for, for bringing this. Uh, Boscart, it's the acronym. A B stands for a background. O stands for objective. So you need to set the objective. Uh, S is the scope. What is scope in and what is out of the scope? C, uh, constraints and communications. A, assumptions. Uh, R, risks. And D, deliverables. So based on this simple approach, we were able to write down to prepare a document less than 10 pages, presenting the high level purpose and the background of the project. That was the first one, for example. Another tool that we used from, from the project management uh, risk register, issue register, uh, monthly progress dashboard. So these were tools and techniques uh, coming from project management that we have incorporated in our innovation scorecard. Uh, all right, guys, you, you already uh, explained everyone that I, that, that I, I, I know more of what this is about because I was part of the uh, third case study. For everyone else, please, what is meant by I scorecard? Good question, actually, what it is. Well, let me start with a, with a version which we called 0.0. .0. This is very the, the very first uh, innovation scorecard stage gate model uh, that was uh, designed in and published in a book uh, in 2016. Uh, this uh, version divides the innovation process, the pipeline into distinct stages and gates. It all starts with a idea generation. If you are asked to solve any issue, any problem, just to come up with some new product, services, whatever it is. First, you need to do is to just come up uh, with, with, with a new idea. So this is the first stage. Typically, how to get the new ideas, uh, you can use a tool like a brainstorming or brainwriting. That is the tool that we use in a, in a second case study. Another tool that can be used is uh, market research. Actually, this is what we did or what you did in, in Y5. You did a market research and you try to find the best suitable technology for your project. So this is the beginning. The second stage, uh, typical activity is uh, to test, testing the feasibility of the new idea for given company, market, or even the time. So what is typical product of uh, idea development or R&D, we can call it R&D simply, is that you do pilots, you do proof of concepts, you design some models and you verify these models. Then the next stage is called pre-implementation. So at this stage, you do all the planning which is needed. You prepare all documents, documentation control, such as, uh, I don't know, as I said, risk register, budget, uh, some kind of roadmap to be able to deliver the innovation to the market, to your customers in general. Another activity that can be part of uh, this stage number three is the testing. It could be, I don't know, integration testing was probably in a Wi-Fi and it was, uh, it was done in, in the CI case study as well. Then what comes next is stage four is the integration of the innovation into your uh, daily business. And then when this uh, is successfully terminated, after a certain period, we recommend to do a post-implementation review, PIR, to ask what was good, what was not so good, if there are some standing, outstanding activities or issues. And this is the model with the stages. And here you can see that between each uh, stages, there is a gate. Gate represents decision making point, some kind of checklist based on metrics that are set at the beginning of the project. The manager can easily check whether the project can proceed to another stage 
or whether it's better to stop, to make a no-go decision. If the no-go decision is made, uh, we recommend the, the, the last part that I didn't describe yet is the innovation incubator, some kind of uh, knowledge database just to park all the information you have about the project where the no-go decision was made, no matter in what stage, just to park it, to save it, and use it probably in a future. In a future, maybe you will be in charge of the project similar to this one, and you can say, okay, so we tried this a couple of months, weeks, years ago, and we realized that this is, a, this is not the right way. So we will not do the same mistake, and we start from the beginning with a different way. So that's the, another important part of the uh, ice core card innovation incubator. This model that is uh, presented here on the slide was uh, designed on the results from the manufacturing industry. So you can see it, it's obvious it's a, it's a waterfall model. But you in software development, you are using agile, such as Scrum or any other uh, agile met approaches, techniques. So first we need to do, when we started uh, the ice core card project in Red Hat, we had to modify the innovation scorecard stage gate model, uh, and we have to fit fit it with a, with a scrum, with a agile, somehow to incorporate uh, the sprints. Eddie will probably talk later on about a case study. Uh, to which was the CI. So what, <clears throat> pardon, what I strongly recommend is uh, to use a stage gate model, but to modify it, to design your own uh, stage gate model that fits best for your project, not to cut and paste this uh, version zero. Uh, we modified it, I think a couple of times, and we will present at least three modifications. So this is version from 2016, and later on, we have a version from 2021. So this is the innovation scorecard. And so to be able to design the innovation scorecard, you need to start with the, the very first step is, you, or actually when we started working with you, uh, Zdeněk, uh, I'm sure there was a, some kind of strategy link alignment with your project. I, don't, I can't imagine that there can exist any project in a company which is not aligned with a strategy. It doesn't make sense to me. So the very first step is to align your project with a strategy, then to present uh, the project background, for example, using uh, the boss card approach and to write down the PDD couple of pages, but I think this is very useful to have it at the beginning. Then to design unique stage gate model for your project or initiative. And then uh, based on principles of OKRs, uh, because in a project background, you already have the objective. You know what is the objective of the project and you need to design the metrics. So OKR, objective and key results, is the approach that we, we, we have to, yeah, we like it. So, uh, and it, what we like, uh, is that it goes straight from the objective to metrics. In the first case study in Atomic Host, we tried, we implemented uh, objective, critical success factors, and KPIs approach. But there were three more steps. Now you go from objective to metrics, direct way. So that's the why I'm here presenting, already presenting, this is the modif it's not a process. This is the process from 2021, the latest one. So based on the objective, uh, you identify, you set the metrics. Uh, what else, what you need for the metrics, for each metric <coughs> is a target. To be able to compare and measure the performance, you need to compare the current status with something. And the easiest way is to compare with the target values. Here again, our experience is that in, in the latest one, in the Wi-Fi project, we used specific data. We used, let's say, a smart principle, specific, measurable, something that was really 
very easy to say yes or no. But on the other hand, uh, our experience from previous project is that we were told by manager of one project, this doesn't work in my team. So don't use it. Try to bring something new, something different, because this doesn't work in my team. So what we did, uh, we came up with trends, just to follow trends. The target value is to increase, decrease something, to increase satisfaction, to decrease cost. But there was no information by how many percent. That was not there. So the target was just to increase and decrease. So our experience is even this works. Uh, this works uh, pretty pretty fine. And the last step, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the last step is uh, that you need to design a data sheet. We use a Microsoft Excel, we use the Google spreadsheet. This is quite common tools that you can use. And the data sheet, I don't have it here on the slide, but uh, if you go to our project website, uh, you can download a template of the data sheet. You can download worksheets uh, from from all three previous projects. So you will have uh, all the information how actually it looks like. In general, data sheet, there are three parts that we used in the past. First part presents the measurement background. The typical what you can find here is the gate and the face. So is the metric uh, for the gate one, gate two, for which gate? The face, is, the, is this the metric uh, measuring the input, process, output, or, or result? What is absolutely critical is to have a name and number of the metric, of course. And uh, who is the owner? And in some case study, we used uh, the link to goal. In some projects, there were more than one goal. So it was necessary to, to be absolutely clear, this metric is linked with this goal. So each goal, there's one rule, one of the rule, uh, how to design performance measurement system. Each goal must have a metric and each metric must have a goal. Goal without metric doesn't make sense. Metric without goal doesn't make sense either. So that's, that's what you can find there. And the last one probably in this area is the brief definition. Just on one line, just to write down what is meant by this metric. That's the background of, of the uh, measurement. The other part is we can call it data characteristics or some specifications. Typically you can find here the frequency. How often do you measure this metric? Is it at the end of each sprint? Is it at the end of each? development round, is it measured weekly? So here you set the frequency of the measurement. Units, uh, another important aspect, you need to somehow specify whether you are measuring uh, dollars, uh, euros, check rounds, uh, time, hours, or minutes, or is or what is the unit? It might be a percentage, of course, as well. So it must be clear, okay, I have a number, but I need a unit to be able to understand what it is. Uh, data collector, who is responsible for collecting the data? It can be uh, here as well. And the data source, where I get the information. And the last part, uh, the third part of the data sheet is, uh, we call it performance information. It, it consists of two things, data baseline, the current data you get or we get, and the target. And then easily it can be compared, are we, are we meeting the target or not? So that's the modified design process of the innovation scorecard. Well, thank you. <laughs> I must say, I, uh, I thought I, I am familiar and I was surprised to know that in the data sheet, there's a column owner, which I find very, very useful. <laughs> <laughs> in my, my uh, professional life. Uh, so th this, guys, feel free to ask if you have questions, if you want to go deeper, anybody from the audience. Uh, Andre just described the, the, the core of the ice core card methodology. Uh, let's, let's go one step back uh, and tell us how did the, how did the uh, theoretical concept uh, 
became a, a methodology. This is the short, uh, this is the long story. <clears throat> it took us, uh, actually it took us three years. Uh, we started in 2019 with this project, but as I said, the very first step was 2013 and 15 of, of, our, uh, of our endeavor. But anyway, in 2019, we were able to start a project since we got a grant from the agency and we launched this uh, only with the theoretical concept. We had the theory of the innovation scorecard, that one that I presented recently. And that's the first, that's the input. Actually, we used or we are still using what we are preaching. We are using input process, output and result model in even in our uh, research pro process. So as an input, there was a theoretical concept. The process, uh, the process is based on three different case studies where we implemented the innovation scorecard concept. After each case study, we get some outputs in, let's say two forms, qualitative outputs, a very valuable lessons learned, as I said, what was good, what was not so good, uh, and uh, quantitative outputs in forms of metrics and hard data. Based on these outputs, after each case study, we have modified, we have enhanced the innovation scorecard methodology and implemented in a, another case study. And this we did three times. And then at the end, uh, there is a methodology. The methodology has already been certified by Czech Society for Quality and the methodology and all information uh, about three case studies and even some templates uh, will be published in a book. The book will be published at the beginning of December, uh, published by Springer. Uh, so this is, the, as Eddie says, one stop shop solution. So in a book, you can find all the information you need for implement the innovation scorecard. So that's the research process. Um, sorry, I made a long story short, but this is the high level how we did. First, there was a theory, then we implemented three times, modify it, and at the end, there's a methodology which has been successfully certified and will be published soon. Approach is quite bold. Uh, I mean, having a theory and testing it on some real, uh, uh, a real project. Uh, how did you know that this will work? Did you do some tests with your family first? <laughs> uh, well, uh, we did a pilot in 2017. I, I have to be absolutely open because otherwise it would be too risky to launch this project and not to be sure that this even has a chance to work. So in 2017, we did a pilot study in Red Hat in PNT DevOps. And yes, it was a tough, but what was, there were two main uh, results of this pilot. First positive was it works somehow, but to make it easy for for users, we need to do more. We need to modify it much more. So that were two main results. Yes, it works, but there's a lots of work to do. So therefore we applied for the grant and that was how we knew it has a chance. But still there was a big, uh, there's a big, there was a big risk factor. Uh, in the Red Hat, uh, in the project, uh, I scored a project uh, that started in 2019. It, anytime it can go wrong. That's the risk, that's why we use the risk register and uh, somehow we try to work uh, with this risk. But we were lucky and it's done, it's completed almost. Good, thank you. And I just noticed that uh, we should be at the Q&A sessions, if I'm right. And I'm 
beginning to actually see some questions. Let me see uh, if. So then I hope I met my target. My target was 40 minutes. So uh, <laughs> you, you, you exceeded it slightly. I think it was, yeah. it was all right. Let me go through the question. And when I feel it is a theoretical question, I will ask it. Yeah, what does the Czech certification mean um, for the US attendees? Is this something that is required for for government contracts or for, for professional certification? Yeah, I can see the question. Well, the Czech certification, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty tricky. Uh, because in the Czech Republic, uh, in our research at the universities, we have uh, some certain policy for R&D. And we have to follow some rules. And it was actually, it was one of challenging areas in our project to find a certification authority for our methodology. We try, we ask, uh, let's say PMI, Project Management Institute, if they are can and if they are willing to certificate the innovation scorecard methodology. But then I check if they can do it in the Czech Republic, the, let's say the authority uh, who evaluates the R&D uh, results from the, coming from universities would say, this doesn't fit with our criteria. So we might have a methodology certified by PMI, that would be amazing. But for the purposes of the R&D in the Czech Republic, it would mean nothing. So, uh, but anyway, we were lucky and we found the institution which was able to follow these rules that we have in the Czech Republic. And I'm not sure, but uh, because these principles are the same, are coming from the EU, so the certificate that we have at this moment might be accepted might be accepted in the EU. In the US, I don't think so. All right, thank you. Uh, I realize I should probably start going through the list uh, when when it started. So first, there is a question which. I feel may have been uh, partially answered by Alexander Slominski. Uh, do you agree with ideas are cheap? Everything is about execution. How do you measure the innovation success? At this moment, I would say park this question for the second part because then uh, we will present the metric, concrete metrics that we used. Okay, I will park it to the second part. Uh, the second question by, by Ben Fisher, I can tell straight away, uh, are any organizations utilizing this framework? If so, can you share the benefits? I feel this is for the second part. Do you agree? Uh, I think we can answer the first part. Uh, yes, uh, Red Hat is using uh, innovation scorecard methodology and the benefits let's wait for a while perfect and i can see another question from ben fisher uh if uh, yes uh, you can download the templates uh, all material that we have except the book which is not published yet if you visit uh, our website iscorecard.org uh, then there is a section uh, and for free, you can download all templates, worksheets, uh, some other material, some articles that we published. Uh, it's all there and it's for free. So feel free to go download, modify and use it. That was the purpose of our initiative. Fifteen minutes ago, Alexander asked, how does this scorecard process relate to uh, Lean Startup methodology and iterative innovation with pilots? pivots? Lean Startup, Eddie. 
Lean is an agile approach, I guess. So if it works with a Scrum, it might work with a Lean. I don't see any issue. What do you think, Eddie? Yeah, I think I think it should work uh, in any environment. I mean, obviously, concepts such as agile, meaning doing something righteous and, and as efficient as you can, or lean, doing the minimum work you need to do to achieve something, uh, would actually be quite productive because you're already working in an environment that is very much controlled and, um, um, shall we say, efficient. So the innovation scorecard would simply support that environment by making sure that you focus on measuring how successful any change or innovation has been. That is quite important because even in a lean or agile environment, you can still end up with doing work not in the best possible way and certainly not in the fastest best possible way. So I think I think I would suggest that the innovation scorecard can be used in any kind of environment. But as Andre said this earlier or early on, it must be modified to meet that particular requirement. Yeah, the two must not be in, shall we say, contradiction or in conflict with each other. They are not there. It's not a, a I win and you lose situation it needs to be complementary that would be my view and if it doesn't work change it but just a note i believe uh, the modification of the innovation scorecard for lean is possible we modified it from waterfall from manufacturing industry uh, for purposes of software development for a scrum so from a scrum to lean i hope it's not such a big step Mm. No, definitely. I mean, in, in some business areas now across the world, people are still using phrases such as best practice. And of course, lean and agile form part of that. Um, I've got a problem with that because best practice implies to me it cannot be improved. So I think that the I scorecard innovation, if you like, is much, much better because it doesn't say it's best practice and it's absolutely perfect, it's absolutely right. It is simply saying, let's try and improve what we are already doing. And maybe something people are already good at, um, but you wanna improve it. That's all it is. Thank you. Uh, Gregos is asking whether you use an specific software to track past decision. Well, uh, yes, at the beginning, it was an, an idea to code some specific software for innovation scorecard. But uh, as I said, we used uh, Microsoft Excel and Google spreadsheets at the end. And the reason why we made this shift uh, from the initial shift purpose was, uh, I know you, you are an IT guy, so probably you, you can modify the software easily, but for those who are not from the IT, who are not familiar with the coding, uh, for these uh, project managers, it's much easier to use uh, Microsoft Excel or Google Spreadsheets template modify it for his or her purpose and use it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are in the second uh, part of today's session. Um, second part is focused on uh, practical examples and I will open this uh, with asking how did you guys transform your, your methodology into practice? Right. Um, so before um, we go into detail there, I just want to recap very briefly 
uh, but from you know some of the things Andres uh, mentioned uh, early on today, because this is very important. Um, in business, very often we have to do things in theory first before we can go into practical application because we need to know in theory does it will it actually work or not and from the theory we then have opportunities to develop the practical application much much better i know there are situations sometimes where companies are pushing hard for answers so you can't always do that but everyone you got the advantage of Andres and I together with many of your colleagues having already done this so we've done three case studies so I think it's fair to say that we we can really talk about the practical application now because it's important now to go to the practical side how did it work in reality what were the problems that you have but more important also is to share with the audience how can they what can they do to practically apply this in their own organization never mind the company they're working for it's the part of the company that they work for um, and as Andres mentioned this morning or sorry the, um, about half an hour ago or so um, he said that the process the initial stage gate model, the process, it needs to be modified to meet the requirements of particular work environments. It will work, in our opinion, in any business, irrespective of location across industries, but you need to modify it to make it work. And that also means taking into account cultural differences so um so if you like we can now first of all talk about um the the modification and verification that we needed to do to turn the theory into practice so this picture here as you can see doesn't look anything like the one andre shared with us earlier why because we learned we knew that the five stage gate model and the three uh, sorry and the five um, stages and the five gates would not have worked in in our first case study which i will explain um, a little bit later and um, so it's very important to modify this draft model if you like to meet your particular needs and requirements and every project all of you as you know if you work in project management every project somehow is different and therefore the flexibility needs to be there to be able to change that and that's exactly what we did we modified this um there was another reason because we we tried this theoretical framework within redhead so we had three projects there or three case studies to try this so the first one um we modified this particular model here to be able to apply it in an agile working environment you know as Andres explained earlier within agile in most organizations that are engaged in software development, they have so-called sprints that typically last two weeks. So they are more um, focused on getting things done and quickly. Yeah, and don't worry about too much process and, 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 and paperwork and so on. Get the things done uh, because they're under pressure to do that. Um, so this, is a good opportunity here for all of you to have a look at how, if you like, simple the process can actually look like. So it's nothing to worry about to, to modify and make it work. Um, and if it doesn't work, find out why it doesn't work and change it. 
it is your process. You can do whatever you wish to do with it, you know? So it's not fixed and it's not cast in stone. So that, that's what I uh, wanted to, to say. And um, uh, one other point here briefly, while we are talking about this, um, you may ask, well, okay, why did you have three different case studies? So obviously, um, we felt one is not enough. We needed to have at least two, but three was really nice, nice to have, to try the theoretical model in three different work environments. And that's exactly what the three case studies provided us with. Um, and as Ondas said uh, earlier, um, this means you can use this in any environment, you know, whether you work in software development, whether you work in an office environment and so on. And just to, to give you a practical example here, um, I will in the not too distant future probably apply, apply this for some uh, work I've been asked to help with in uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia for a defense company. Now, so this has nothing to do with software development or uh, agile environment. So it will be totally different and it will be interesting to see using this concept, how that can help to change the organization they want to change. I can't go into detail uh, because of confidentiality, but they wish to become a different organization. And I think this scorecard would be an ideal candidate for achieving that. Yeah. Um, so, so why did we did why why did we do this? Well, first of all, we wanted to test and learn, because we had to try something and see would it actually work in that particular environment. So we were not, if you like, too hung up about um, making mistakes because that's that's important sometimes i mean be careful not to make uh, so not to make uh, the big mistakes in business that will actually put you out of business so um but you need to test and try sometimes um and we needed to find out okay what works well and what doesn't how how is the process working for for us in this particular case study um and we needed to find out what is still missing. So if it doesn't quite work well yet, why? What is it we need to do to make it work? Um, so we, we, we needed to make sure that this actually will work in practice. And that's exactly what we've done here. Uh, we used this model in, 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 the, in the first uh, case study. Um, and, and to test and see how, how it worked. So here we've got the first practical application and we put some nice words here. We were walking before running and that is an important point. You know, don't do things too quickly because you, be, you can sometimes become overconfident and that is when things go wrong. So we were slowing down a bit. Let's first try and find out um, what can we do and, and, and what is a good company to work with. So um, you know, Sedena, from 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 your point of view, probably, um, you know, why particularly Red Hat? Why did we choose Red Hat as a company to to do this? And, and I think there were a number of, of, uh, of reasons. One, Red Hat is a very young and dynamic uh, company and it's open to change and innovation. And you are working in, an, in a very competitive environment where changes are necessary in order to respond to increases from the market and customers. Yeah, customers nowadays are becoming very, very demanding um and we also liked uh, the opportunity to be able to use 
different work environments. So we were aware of the fact that Red Hat is not just IT and software development, but of course you've got other departments where people do different work, for example, project management and, and so on. So it was a good opportunity um, to get engaged with, with Red Hat to, to, try, um, to try our theory. Um, if, if I may, Eddie, uh, you've mm -hmm. already mentioned openness and from my perspective, openness of Red Hat was the critical factor yeah. to, to start working with Red Hat. Yeah. Yeah, so it was we were not hindered in any way, and uh, and and that is that is um, open to change and innovation. That is quite quite an important part. Yeah, you guys, it's 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 good. It's nice to hear from an outsider that st we still have it. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So um, so that that's what we did, um, and if you want to. Um, go into the first case study here so i'm not going into any technical details so ladies and gentlemen don't worry about this uh, this is more to show you that for example you can see here um the first case study there it was about um, um, something to do with automation tool and we we set goals and critical success factors yeah remember the difference uh, a kpi or a key performance indicator <clears throat> usually is very specific to do this by a certain date or time or to achieve a 25 percent improvement whereas the critical success factor is more strategic it's high level you know so we focused on just a couple of goals here as you can see and we had a number of critical success factors now this is the approach we took at this point in time but if you remember what andre said earlier um he said well towards the final case study we did away with critical success factors so we went straight from the objective into the metrics into, into the measurement and uh, again this is a learning process because we felt let's keep things as simple as possible but effective so it was quite a challenge yeah so be careful that you don't cut too many corners as the english expression goes it means don't shorten things too much make sure you do whatever you need to do to achieve your targets your goals and objectives so that is very very important this is true for any project and any work environment uh, so this is this is no different um so that's what we did um so we we simply um went for a quite if you like simple and easy approach to to get going to, to see how effective the innovation scorecard uh, would be in that particular work environment. Um, so, as, as, Andy, I'm sorry, uh, since there was a question about the lean, I think we made a high scorecard lean in this case study. As I yeah. said, we made it as simple as possible. We use only two gates yeah. for measuring yeah. before and after each development round. Yeah. And there were totally free development rounds yeah so that i mean it can be used in any environment whether it's agile lean whatever it you, you can use it um so if we have a look at the further details um and here i'm not going through all but you can see here um so we used the um input process output and results approach so this by the way uh, as Anders mentioned early on um, is based on what the international standards organization have done iso uh, in their standard the current standard for um, quality iso 
9001 and it's the 2015 standard is still valid at the moment we use that approach and you may ask well why because what is good for ISO 9001 must be good for this because it's proven uh, it's internationally recognized and companies who've got the ISO 9001 standard are basically certified as working in a quality way and that means something so we felt yeah that's that's exactly what we need for for our um, innovation scorecard um, and you can see on here the various metrics there so we we put together um, we started off with some very simple metrics because we didn't want to go um, too much into detail. We, we needed to do things step by step, try and trial and error first. Yeah. And we didn't want to push too hard in terms of targets. So here, as you can see on, on the right hand side, some of the target values are there they are not specific so it's it's not do this um, and achieve 50 percent or reduce it by 15 percent or you know they're not specific um numerical targets there but what you find is words such as reduce or minimize and that worked not just for us it also worked for red hat because the environment that we um, were in during the first um, case study, uh, people preferred that. They didn't, I think they were very collaborative and cooperative, but we had to make sure that we were not pushing too much. So we felt, yeah, guys, if you are comfortable with that, um, so are we. You know, we were just glad and just thankful that we had an opportunity to actually apply the scorecard and um, and and perfect so we had very good cooperation very good support from all the staff involved and um, and this actually worked and and we found out that actually doing this in this way for the atomic host uh, case study was quite effective yeah so the first early lessons learned here, um, I know I'll go into more details later. The first early lessons here is don't be afraid to make changes and come up with something different and new. Yeah. And don't even be afraid to measure how successful you have been doing it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, and, 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 and within Red Hat, certainly people are in the, in the right uh, work environment to do that because they're actually encouraged to come up with innovative ways of doing things. Um, so the first case study was an eye opener for us because it was positive because we realized, yeah, we are on the right track here. We knew, yes, we need to make some more modifications because the next case study will be in a slightly different area never mind this worked yeah um so i i think there, there were quite a few lessons learned which i will share later on we don't need to go through them now um and but what i would like to say here also we we sometimes um and it doesn't it doesn't matter which area of work you work in sometimes you will find um, that things do go wrong and there may be a certain intervention in other words there may be something that can happen outside of your control and suddenly you have to stop and that was something that happened to us you know everything went smoothly and it wouldn't it was really nice and it worked and then we had to stop for quite some time because of something happened outside of our control so it's important to be aware of that these things happen this is life so uh, and i think um in summary then so no specific target values here 
and um, basically the um, the reason also why we had to reduce our stage gate model there because I think if I remember right the program manager from Red Hat actually insisted that we do so there was a bit of um, a bit of a direction there from from within the company within the organization and uh, but that was fine you know when you do these initiatives you you have to be flexible that's the key word you know you need to uh, respond to changes and challenges and that is quite important so thank you so the next um, slide then um, so the second practical application and as you can see on there we cleverly put some words we started to run so walking was over or honeymoon was over as as people say and therefore it was time to get on with the job and do something more so we were given a unique opportunity to look for more challenges and um, improvements so the second case study came to light and we were lucky that Red Hat agreed that we could use the innovation scorecard in one of their projects uh, known as CI or continuous integration and here um, you can see a quite an important uh, um, sentence here that I think I can just read out because it speaks for itself is the the um, objective if you like of, of the CI project or continuous integration project was uh, to deliver um, code changes faster with fewer errors and at lower cost so the some of the things are fairly standard but as you can see fast changes fast not so many errors and reduce the cost so quite a few challenges there uh, so the first thing we did is clarified and put together if you like a list of what we thought the project goals were to make sure that everyone had the same understanding so and you can see the goals there for example the current process that they were using to improve that and make sure it works so it's about process improvement it's part of change management if you like reduce or minimize maintenance that is quite important um, in many software development areas improve the speed of managing file issues so in, in other words when when issues or problems were highlighted and and they became uh, aware of problems uh, improving how these were dealt with and reduce engineering input time so you can see by just looking at these we are going away quite or we were going away quite a bit from the technical side we also included the human the people side for example engineering input time people people's time um, the, the speed of managing issues that is also usually to do with people management you know how quickly people deal with these so the project goals here were different and in different areas to the compared to the first case study so you can see now slowly but surely we were moving away a little bit from the technical side and we also brought in new areas such as people issues and and, and so on so it's quite important and, and it also shows that the innovation scorecard can be used in any work environment there's no limitation 
So that I think is 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 probably enough as an as an overview. So if we now look at a little bit more in detail, um, there are sort of three slides coming up now, um, and, and they move from gate one to gate two and gate three. That's all. So have a look at the uh, the process there. Yeah, you can see we had three stages and three gates. So that again, different to what uh, Andres presented first uh, uh, when we first started this presentation, we modified that to fit the particular need of that uh, case study. Um, and as you can see there, we had some very gate specific um, metrics. And I think what is important is to certainly at this stage, what was important is to look at what metrics could we use for this particular case study. Because we now had a different work environment compared to the first case study. So we had to modify our thinking and our approach. And I think that worked quite well. The process we used exactly the same input, process, output and result. So that does not and has not changed throughout all three case studies. Why? Because it worked. And, and why change it if it works well? Um, so the metrics here that you can see and don't worry about the numbers. Um, for example, take the first one there work effort for given tasks. So we are here talking about now what work effort people were putting in for the tasks or the given tasks that they had to complete. So we, we were starting to look in, in different areas for means of improving what is in place at the moment. Quality of the current process. This is about process improvement. Yeah. So the first one is about effort, work effort. The second or the, the, the next one <clears throat> looked at process improvement. Then you have things there such as improving the quality of generated ideas. Remember Andres early on mentioned um, one of the important things is always to think about what can we do? What should we be doing? So come up with some new ideas, particularly for managing change. And um, so you can see here that simply making a few changes, focusing on the new work environment has helped us to apply the uh, innovation scorecard <clears throat> in a fundamentally different environment to the first case study. And if you look at the target values there, they also appear to have changed a little bit. Yeah, like we still have a minimize there or maximum, but suddenly you have also like minimum five or 75%. Yeah, maximum 50,000 check corona in terms of a financial, financial target. Now, um, it's quite interesting to see how you can measure how successful you have been by thinking about the metrics that are most appropriate for those work areas. So if, if, if there's nothing wrong, uh, and we did that, to produce a list, and we probably had 20, 30 on our list, but we realized, okay, come on, we can't, you know, remember what Andres said earlier, plenty is 20, uh, 20 is plenty or something. Uh, well, okay, w what is realistic? Top five. So we focused on what we thought were the top five measurements or metrics. And that's what you can do in your own work environment as well. Focus on the most important things where a change 
or an innovation is necessary. So don't do things just for the sake of doing it. Do it for a good and valid reason. And that way you will also find that the business will be behind you more and support. So, um, so we were becoming better and better. In other words, we developed our metrics much more. Um, then moving on to the next gate, um, so we, we, we now had um, the metrics here. Um, we developed these more for the following gate, because obviously as you go from one stage to the next stage to the next, it's necessary to review all the um, measurements and all the metrics that you have um, in place. To, to see, okay, are they still valid for this particular gate? Are they necessary? Do we need to modify them? Are they, are they right? You know, in, instead of um, achieving a target of 75%, maybe we can only really realistically achieve 50 and so on. So you can modify these. Or some of the, some of the metrics, um, change them. Because initially, you might think, yeah, they will fit, uh, they are fine. But as you go along in the case study, you may find it's necessary to make some changes. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, because there's nothing worse, I think, is than having some, some metrics or measurements that you are simply using because you think you have to use them they need to make sense, you know, as new information becomes available, as the, the, the case study or the project progresses to the next phase, you have new information available, and you need to make changes if, if it's necessary. This is normal, that's, that's normal life. Um, so we were, we were quite, by that time, I think we were quite sure that we were on, on the absolute right track. And then the, the, the final one is uh, the, the last gate here, gate three. And uh, so we finalized all the metrics and measurements that we wanted to use. Um, one, one thing here you noticed, um, suddenly there are some different ones again, like senior management commitment and so, so you, it's absolutely fine that you review metrics and measurements from gate to gate to make sure that they are still right and they're still valid for that particular gate. Because things change outside your control. Suddenly the scope can change as anyone who works in a project environment knows. You know, you plan for what you know, and suddenly your customer or, or your, your senior management team says, oh, and we want this included. So things suddenly change. It means you have to respond to that. You can't just ignore it. If you ignore it, it's very career limiting, I think. <laughs> That's the right term. Um, so quite important. So here, again, you can see the development going from the first gate to the second gate and the third and that's exactly what all of you can do in your work environment with the templates that we are providing on the website and um, with a little bit of help and support maybe uh, and certainly try you should be able to repeat this you know feel confident uh, don't don't worry about making mistakes they are there to be made um, because if you don't make mistakes you don't learn you know that's something in real life that happens um, so that was basically a brief summary maybe quite detailed but it's necessary i think to explain that as you go along nothing is ever fixed 100 percent you know, be, be aware of that and be able to respond to changes, you know, be, be, be flexible. 
Okay. So then case study. The final one, the finish line. Now, by that time, we were running, uh, but we were not running away from the case study, okay? So, no. We, we were just, I think, if I remember right, we were very happy and content at that point that our approach is a good and the right approach because we learned so many things. And we felt, yes, giving the opportunity uh, that Red Hat provided us with, and particularly with the help and support from Zdenek as well, uh, it was really a, a privilege to be on that particular project and, and try and help to move not just that project forward, but also the project to help us to move the innovation scorecard forward. So it was a, a, a two way process, you know, and uh, and it, it really it really worked well. Um, so why did we have the third uh, case study? Because we felt having completed the first two case studies, we needed to try it in a different work environment. Yeah, not so much software development, but something different. Um, where there was a mixture, perhaps, of technical issues and some human being, you know, human resource management issues and, and so on. So we thought, okay, what that also means, more work for us, which was fine. We were coping with that. And we would say, okay, that means we have to come up with some more specific metrics because it's a different environment, different new challenges. So let's not just repeat all the stuff we've done before. Let's try something, come up with something new and something different. And the, the final challenge was actually to put the theory now to the real test because the third case study that was the real test yeah so we we knew that we um we couldn't let zdenek down and make too many mistakes or whatever and we needed to come up with something to to help so we were quite under pressure to get that done so did Enek, you got any question that you it's, it's, it's just a matter of how, how uh, to what degree do you want me to explain the, the global Wi-Fi rollout? It might be an idea just to give everyone a high level overview. Yeah. 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 So I will, of course, provide only my perspective. So mm -hmm. uh, in December 2020 or January 2021, uh, me and the folks around in one one sub sub IT department of Red Hat, we came to realize that uh, that we can do so much more if we if we if we uh, innovate. Specifically, there was a one project uh, called Mission Impossible, where I was uh, uh, surrounded by brilliant minds, uh, my colleagues. Uh, Brent, John, and Fabiano, and together what we manage is parallel installation of IT infrastructure in 50 offices in three months. Every day was a go live. So that that was a, that was an inflection point for realizing, hey, if we if we do something completely different, we can achieve much more. And uh, in January there was this challenge of of doing a Wi-Fi pilot of one site and. It will not stop stop there, right? So there will be if you do a pilot of Wi-Fi in one office, mm -hmm. it will then be rolled out, and if it's rolled out, then it makes sense to prepare this carefully, create something, not sure what, doing something we don't know what we want, but we want it because we know we need it. <laughs> this is how uh, how. Uh, 
what, what was the mental shift in, shift in, in my, my head. Now, just to describe very, very briefly what this global Wi-Fi rollout uh, maybe stages were about. It started a couple of years ago. The idea generation phase was uh, Red Hat came to a decision that we want to consider altering uh, the, the wireless technology that we're using right now. There was some pilot uh, network guys were evaluating several 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 options uh, after careful elaboration they they uh, decided on on a specific product or products which they want to use and stage two was doing pilots doing real installations in several sites in specifically in Bern and Stuttgart uh, as part of that we realized we must prepare whatever needs, I, I call it framework, processes, mm -hmm. tools to allow parallel installation, to allow to, 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 to be able to support management, whatever decision will they make to do one office, to do 50 offices, how to do it. If you, if you don't have unlimited workforce, you, you, need to, you need to plan, you need to come up with something. You don't know what, but you, you know you need it. So that was the that was the stage three, and now right now me and my colleagues are in round one of stage four when we're really deploying uh, what we call Wi-Fi six in twelve mm -hmm. offices right now. Uh, that's in a nutshell. I hope I wasn't too too verbose. No, no, no. Zdenek, thanks for that, but I'm curious. Uh... I can still remember our meeting, and I think it was the beginning of January, when I was presenting you the innovation scorecard and our existing achievements. And I'm curious, I never asked you, so let me ask you now, what convinced you to agree with innovation scorecard implementation in this project? Why you said, yes, we'll come on board in this mission impossible? So, to be perfectly honest, it was uh, it was uh, a situation where I could not lose. If 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 somebody who I consider to be an expert or or even think tank or experienced people, people who are just like me, passionate in project management but have vast vaster greater knowledge, I, I could I couldn't lose or we couldn't lose even as a Red Hat. So I was actually. Uh, I'm proud for this, uh, or I'm, I'm gra gratitude is the word that I feel. That, that's that's what I feel. I, I I was very pleased that I had the opportunity to to have you with me for seven months. It was our pleasure too, was Yeah, worked. It, I think it worked both ways. Definitely, uh, you definitely. know. Yeah. We learned a few things you did, and hopefully we were able to help, and and so on. Uh, no, that was that was a good overview. So that was that was that was quite good. Um, and um, everyone, as you can see from here, on, on on if you look on at this picture here, uh, we modified. Surprise, surprise! We modified the process again, because here you can see now we have four stages and four gates, not three, and. That just proves the point made earlier. Um, you need to modify this to meet your specific requirements. And don't be afraid to do that. Absolutely right. Um, and if you don't do it, no one else will. So <laughs> be, be absolutely bold and, 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 and do it. Um, usually I find by doing that, people will follow you later because they can see the benefits for doing it. And as soon as you as you have benefits, people will always follow you. You know, <laughs> there's a good reason for that. So um, here, um, the top five metrics. Uh, we had a list, uh, if I remember right, we had a list of, I think it was nearly thirty or so the metrics. Twenty plus, definitely. More yeah, there's a long, a long list of metrics because obviously we we said, well, let's sit down and really think hard what metrics would be appropriate for this particular project and as you can tell 
that list was too long because you cannot have 20, 25 or 30 metrics. Um, so we really focused mainly on the top five here. I think there were one or two uh, additional ones, six and seven, but the top five were these five that you can see here on the slide. Um, so for us, important um, quality of the ideas, that was absolutely a, a must. We needed to get these right. Um, I think from your point of view, Zdenek, I think you had um, a requirement by saying, yeah, um, we, we need to measure, you know, how all this works in the current um, environment that we have, the hardware and software that has already been installed. Um, so we need some metrics to measure how um, how we can improve on that. Uh, lost time, that seemed to be quite an important one, which is why it's number three here on the list. Um, in, in many work processes, when you actually start to dig in, to look for opportunities of um, improving how people can get things done and, and, you know, what are they spending their time on to get something done? If you reduce that by, for example, changing the process slightly, it's amazing sometimes how much time you can actually gain. Um, and, you know, if I, if I can use one example here, I hope Zdenek, you don't mind. Uh, it's, it's a typical one, um, for example, and I find this is a, a problem in many companies and organizations. Uh, it's the sign off process where in many companies, and I've worked for big firms like Vodafone, British Telecom and so on. Um, it, it Sometimes it takes four weeks to get something signed off. And that means it delays the project, you know making some minor changes and then measuring after okay we change in the process so instead of four weeks we take two days to get the signatures and then you do some you use the innovation scorecard to measure that how successful you've been you come to the conclusion it's a win because th that that is just one practical example about lost time or uh, in the case of, um, I'll come back a little bit to software development, where a developer is waiting for someone else to do something that stops them from doing the work that they could be getting on with, but they can't because they're waiting for someone else to do something else. You know, reducing those lost times, and they're not always obvious. You know, it's not until a project suddenly is delayed and can't go live and people do some analysis and that's where the innovation scorecard comes in where, where you do the analysis and you suddenly realize wow actually yes we are our worst enemy <laughs> we we have processes in place that if we make some minor changes here and there christ we could actually save i don't know 25 30 percent and that's how you recover this if, if, if I may bring a little bit more uh, color and specifics, because I, I was yeah. inside yeah. this project. Uh, mm -hmm. The metric one, acceptance criteria. Red Hat now has criteria, criterion, how to, or we know how, when we can quantify that wireless in Office ABC is reliable. So, so it, it's, it's not easy, it took, took us some time to create, to define acceptance, acceptance criteria. What does it mean when we say that wireless is reliable? Mm -hmm. that, that's the practical application in my, in my eyes or in mm -hmm. my mind of, of why it's so important to, to confine pool of KPIs or metrics to, to just small number, but pick the right ones. Yes. Same for collisions with current hardware and software. This was so important to, to keep focus on this aspect. I, 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 I couldn't emphasize this enough. It, hmm. it helped uh, my IT team and the IT team uh, next to me 
to mm -hmm. uh, to uh, focus on this and and take some actions yeah yeah i remember uh, uh, there was one um there was one uh, specific example i think if we were talking, we were discussing um, without going into detail, but you, you talked about, okay, do we know what is already in place at the various sites? And and uh, people made so-called assumptions like, yeah, we think it's is that. that. Them. Is it me again? Pardon? We can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Same issue with the sounds, Danik. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So um, as I was saying, it was it was um, basically to use the scorecard to to um, get to the point of let's not make assumptions whether something is in place or not. Let's actually physically check whether there is some hardware or whatever installed on the premises, you know. And um and 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 I think that is quite important because when you when you're involved in, in something big like a global like a Wi-Fi rollout, um you need to have details and, and confirmation that what equipment is installed in which location because if you don't have that you could be making the wrong assumptions and you're sending teams in there to do an installation to install something that is already in place or you don't know something is in place and they need to remove it first before before you can bring in some uh, new equipment and so on so it was quite quite an important one here um Another one on the list, uh, vendor management. This is about um, making sure that the um, supplier, so vendor management is about managing the suppliers to make sure that the company gets the best possible service that the vendor or the supplier actually delivers and in some cases installs exactly what was ordered yeah on time and within uh, certain uh, parameters you know technical issues and so on uh, it's very important to get that right because what you don't want is that you use the same suppliers again if they are not performing because then you have the same issues in the next project uh, end user satisfaction, I think that was probably one of the very important ones, is to be able to measure how successful were the end users with the new solution. You know, did the new Wi-Fi, for example, where it was installed, make a difference to their way of working? Were they able to connect all their equipment? faster more efficient not so many breakdowns and and so on um and so i think those five metrics were probably the top um they were from a long list as i explained earlier and the reason um, and, and how did we arrive at these well we sat down and we had like a brainstorming session and then we uh, looked at each work area first and said, okay, what kind of metrics would be relevant, would be useful, would be acceptable for any of these areas? And then I'm afraid some of that is based on personal practical experience. So obviously, um, I've been working in telecommunications most of my life. And so therefore, I, I understood uh, quite a lot of the background and some of the issues. Um, so I think it's important to um, develop the metrics, do a, a set of draft metrics first, and that should be done, in my opinion, by the project team. Then that was shared with uh, Zdenek first, 
uh, no one else and uh, to see are we on the right track here were we too drastic or too um you know too pioneering uh, so we had to get that right and uh, and then we in also engaged uh, some of the team members to review them and to arrive at final list of the most important ones. So that's a, it's process driven. Uh, and, and how uh, there was one question I meant, I saw early on, how did you actually, how do you write up these metrics? Well, you do your thinking. So you look at each work area and then you think, okay, what, measurements do we knew, do we need to have or could we have in place to measure what so where are changes possible where potentially are improvements possible and then come up um, with some draft solutions then discuss it with the client or the customer if you like project manager in charge of the project and then you can discuss it with a wider team after that, once the PM um, has given their approval in principle. So that, that's how we arrived at these, you know. And there's nothing wrong. You can have a list as long as you like, because it's a good idea. You, can, you, you have more options and you can know oh, that is not quite so urgent. So in other words, you are starting to put things in order of priority. And that is exactly what you need to do. If you remember right, Zdenek, you mentioned early on, getting the priority right is for is quite important for us. We can't do always everything, so we need to focus on what is possible to do now, you know. Um, and that's what we did. That that's why we had just these uh, top five metrics in the end. Um. As a proper timekeeper, it is my duty to tell you it's 16.50. Yeah. <laughs> you may need a little, little bit more time than just 10 minutes, yeah? Yeah, just okay. in case. <laughs> yeah. so, so overall lessons learned. Um, everyone, as you, as you can see, we've got a, a, a reasonably long list there. Um, so I, I'm not going through all of these. Uh, but for me, some of the most important lessons that we learned, first one, as I mentioned before, start with something simple and then move to something more difficult. You know, don't run before you can actually walk. It's as simple as that. Uh, and any process, any work process that you are looking at changing and you think oh this needs to be modified and improved make sure that it will make a difference uh, in terms of business needs because if it doesn't provide any benefit why change it doesn't make any difference doesn't make any sense and always bear in mind people because any any process work process where you need to manage people who need to follow the new process. Yeah, make sure that you engage them in the process whenever possible. Because then it becomes their process and they're more likely to adopt it. It's quite important. Um, and then the third one, I'll just pick the top three or four. Uh, communications, more effective communications. We we quite often heard from people, and this is across all the projects. This is not just uh, the global Wi-Fi. This is an overall lessons learned. Uh, we, we felt that uh, in many areas, people were saying, oh, I didn't know that. I, I, did, I wasn't sure whether I should do that. I thought you were doing it. And, and so we identified um, this as a potential area for um, future improvement it, it's the communications channel how you communicate things to people there was a another communication issue and actually it happened almost three times in each our case study it was explaining clearly to engineers and other participants in the project 
why we want to measure this and that. What is the purpose of measuring anything we measured? Yeah. yeah. That happened with the atomic, with the CI. Then later on in the CI, it was actually part of uh, PIR of the CI project. One of what was not so good was that at the beginning, the team didn't understand well why they should collect the data and share the data and for, with us. They mm -hmm. didn't see the purpose in measuring that. Then later on, in after a couple of sprints, they understood that was fine. But they at the beginning, that was a lesson learned for our team. Mm -hmm. Explain why clearly, why we do measuring of this and that. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, basically, they they most of these are yeah, self-explanatory. But I think number six for me is quite important: not to be afraid to make process changes. You know, this is life; things change, and you cannot stand still because if you do, the competition will not. So it's very important to be open to process change but it's how you manage that and in terms of people management uh, i think that is very important to engage people in the process um to, so that they feel they have made the change if you know what i mean you know they feel involved and they are not afraid to do it um and empowering people more you know we had many times across the three projects where uh, people were waiting to be told what to do instead of saying, oh, okay, uh, I'm empowered. I, I think this is what we need to do. This is what we will do now. So they were wait, but I, yeah, I was waiting for you to tell me what to do, you know? So empowering people can also make a some substantial difference how you can achieve innovation and how you can uh, uh, be, be let's say very effective at change management you know um, saying to people look i trust you you've got the knowledge and experience make a decision whatever is right that needs to be done well i mean within reason i mean obviously you, you can't just empower people and say okay as of tomorrow you can spend any amount of money you wish you know there need to be some some uh, limitations, but generally speaking, people who are empowered to do things are usually less frightened of change because they feel they're part of it. It becomes their daily bread and butter, as it's called. And I think that was overall um, uh, quite quite a good. Um, summary of, of of some of the lessons learned there so um andres i think you um, sum up. yeah just to, to come up with the uh, summary there so we are at the end of the presentation we are almost at the end of the project and now uh, at the beginning i was talking about the process um, expectation what we were supposed to deliver and again i can say we delivered the methodology that has been certified. We have published uh, a series of four article, articles in Project Management Institute uh, platform, which is called Knowledge Shelf. So if you are members of PMI, you can log in and you can read four articles about our experiences uh, with the Innovation Scorecard application in Red Hat. And uh, these articles, I have to say, they are high level and there was a limit i think two or three thousand words but if you are interested in the methodology and the case studies in details uh, the book will be published in a december as i said and in the book you will find the complete methodology version 2021 information detailed information from all three case studies except the, the, the last one the the Wi-Fi case study. Since it is ongoing project, we are not publishing the data, we are publishing the list of metrics, but not the data yet. So it, it's too early to publish it now. 
And in a book, you can also find a templates uh, that can inspire you and they are free to use in, in your businesses. And as I already answered, one of the questions is, uh, there is any material that you can download? Yes, visit our iScorecard website and you can download all documents that we can share with you. You can find it there. Okay, uh, so just for the um, purposes of, of uh, making everyone aware, I, I think we still should should stay at least 10 minutes. Uh, before we go to the q and I think it's time to, to, to ask you uh, what you consider to be the benefits of, of uh, the I scorecard methodology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think overall, um, I would, um, I think I've got a number of benefits that I would like to share with everyone. Um, I mean, certainly, um, one of the benefits is that the application of the scorecard uh, across all three of our case studies proved and showed that generally collaboration and consultation uh, between individuals and teams in those areas were improved. There was a, a significant improvement, how people worked together, how they communicated and, and, and helped each other and, and so on. You know, um, that to me was one of the most important points. Uh, this is sort of like an internal benefit. Um, a business benefit would be improved work processes this is i mean obvious benefit for for any business um, and again at business level i would say we were able to help with reducing the wasted time that i described early on uh, in, in the talk so wasted time uh, or opportunities how to improve that and, and have less wasted time um, I think I think that worked that worked quite well. We had clear, you know, there was one uh, case study um, I think where a simple one simple process changed uh, change led to something like um, I don't know saving four five six hours, and this was just a simple minor change, and immediately people saved quite a bit of time. Um, at Red Hat level, I think um, it's using an innovation scorecard helped or helps the company to maintain leading edge um, in innovative work approaches. So to, to be able to continue to bring in innovation, to make changes, to become innovative more and more and respond to the ever increasing demands of the market. So at, at Red Hat level, that is absolutely a benefit. Um, higher level of empowerment within people, so people feel more empowered. That has done wonders. We, we saw the results in, in some work areas. Suddenly people became far more cooperative and helpful and willing to do things and take on board work extra work without having to be asked you know those sort of ch obvious changes um, and then at customer level i think also there's an important benefit and that is um, an increased confidence by customers in red hat because when customers see that a business or organization is investing in something like innovation scorecard in order to be as good and as competitive as they can be and, and to, to i don't know improve internal processes and in uh, make people work in a different way that gives them confidence in the organization they're more likely to give you repeat business because they don't see a need to change. This is a good company to work for and work with because they are not afraid to 
use things such an innovation scorecard in order to gain, if you or maintain, competitive advantage. Thank you. Uh, I, I still feel I have uh, certain I think, may I? Yeah. May, may, I, may I raise this question and I ask you the same question? Can you share with us the benefits from your perspective of having innovation scorecard in your project? Specifically in the Wi-Fi project, it really helps because if you're on, on an innovation, you will realize that it's, uh, it's not a problem of... Uh, the, the, the problem is asking the right questions. That's absolutely the problem, <laughs> because, because it's 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 something you you do not know how to do it best. So so applying applying uh, methodology such as such as this one greatly reduces the complexity <laughs> and allows to fo to what what gets uh, to to focus on it and what if you focus on it you can make. Here you can even measure it. If you can measure it, you you make sure that it can get done or improve improvements can happen. Mm. That's that's how I see it. Thank you, Zdenek. And maybe are there any uh, people from CI or from the Atomic in the audience? Are you willing to share your experience with the innovation scorecard as well? Are you willing to join us for a while? Have a look. And if not, never mind. Mm -hmm. I, I I realize we're we're slightly overflowing. Let me let me ask you the obvious question just to be absolutely sure. If anyone would ask the question, if I were to, to apply this in my area. What do you suggest I do first? What would you respond? Well, personally, um, I, I would say the first thing to do always is to do your thinking. Uh, because if you don't, you're likely to go off and you, you, you look at all different areas. So first question would be, okay, what is it I wish to improve and why because unless you you do that thinking um, you are simply looking for something to apply it and it may not be the right area or it may not be for the right reasons so I would always say do your thinking first and then decide okay now that I've decided in this and this and this area there is room for I want to improve things and innovate and I want to know how successful the innovation has been that then means you can start the process that Andras described right at the beginning by using the methodology if you like and follow the same principles and processes that we used for example you can put together your project definition document if you wish just to capture what is the scope what is not in scope so you you're beginning to define more the areas that you need to have a look at or you wish to have a look at and that way you are more likely to actually deliver where you wish to improve otherwise you just do it for the sake of doing it and that i don't think is is a good idea you know you need to have a good specific reason something may not be as good as you think it could or should be okay can we improve it so this will be an opportunity to uh, challenge can this area be improved and you can with the help of the innovation scorecard you can have a look at a before and after because obviously you can look at what do, how do we do things at the moment what do I want to achieve after? How did we get there and how successful were we? So use the process that we are recommending. In other words, use use the process this morning or the, 
you know, th th this afternoon, but early in the session that Ondrash described, um, use the, the, the Boscard principle, you can do that, put the PDD together, and that is a very good starting point. That's where many projects fail, when, when people don't produce an initial draft project definition document. And people, but I thought you were doing this, and I thought you would, you know, do the thinking first, then put whatever you thought about into a, go, go through the list, pick out the things that are realistic, that you can achieve, and then put those in order of priority and then focus on that. And that way you will you will be more successful. Yeah, and, be, and, be, and, and be lean and agile. <laughs> in, a, in the next step, uh, I think it's important to design unique stage gate process for your project initiative, whatever it is. What is the starting point? What is the next and the next and what is at the end? Then to divide it and try to generate as the disappeared. Uh, generate the list of metrics, potential metrics. So I don't recommend to try to set the list of metrics for the first time. Prepare a list, review it two times, three times, discuss about it. Why is this metric? What is it good for? And the same issue is actually with the target values. We had many sessions when we discuss only the metrics and once we were 100% sure we want these five, six metrics, we start talking about the target values because setting target values effectively is not that so easy. You can say, okay, so what is the limit? Sky is the limit. It's difficult to be mm -hmm. used. Uh, guys, if you don't mind, I will slowly go through the, the parked questions. Ben Fisher asked uh, to share uh, benefits of this framework. I think this was answered, if you agree. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alexander asked, how do you measure innovation success? I think, I think we have provided a list of metrics from those. So. Lovely. Yeah. I mean, basically here, the, uh, just to summarize is you need to have before and after data, obviously, you, because you can, you can measure that. You can say, okay, before we made any changes, it was like this. Now that we've made the changes, it's like that. And then, then you can see what the difference is. Yeah. 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 And it's not always in numbers and figures. It could, sometimes people tend to forget uh, the benefits can also be in terms of goodwill, you know, suddenly you may have team members who become more, shall we say, cooperative and more willing to help and, and provide additional help rather than being asked all the time. So there, there are sometimes things that are a bit difficult to measure, but you still can see the benefits. Carsten Waite asked uh, if... Uh... If you plan a community of practice, practice around ice core card and uh, sub, sub, uh, the, the next question if, is if uh, the ice core card methodology is licensed product, at least that's how I interpreted it. No, no, it's not. It, it's free for to use. We don't have any license, nothing. So as I said, visit our website, download templates, whatever you want and fits for your purposes and use it for free. We encourage you to do this actually. It was our intention to, let's say, uh, spread the innovation scorecard in our businesses. So there is no license. And the first part was some public community. Am I right? Well, uh, yeah, like, community uh, of yeah, practice, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, definitely, uh, this project is almost over, but uh, it doesn't mean that we close the innovation scorecard forever. Like I would say, end of the book. So definitely, we will at the end the, the I scorecard team. We will discuss the future of the innovation scorecard, and we will keep you posted. Maybe the easy way is to watch the I to to follow the I scorecard website. 
and we will share some updates there. I don't, I'm not saying it will be soon, like next week, but still there is a potential of the innovation scorecard to be used and shared and spread all over the world. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we've been uh, through all the questions. Uh, anyone want, wishes to wishes to say some final sentence? Yeah, I think um, for me, um, one of the probably most important points would be for anyone. Uh, do not feel afraid to make changes and use something like the innovation scorecard in order to do that you know um, for any of your work areas irrespective of which company you work for and which area you work in you will find there is potentially a possibility for you to use the scorecard modify it to make it fit and don't be afraid to do that it's not fixed it's there as a starting point. It's a, it's a, it's a not an, um, a destination. It's, it's sort of like a, a journey and it's ongoing. For me, I'm really happy that within those three years, we were able to confirm that innovation scorecard really works. It started as a theory as we presented today. And we put it in a real life, into real challenging environment, and the innovation scorecard works. It's not one size fits all solution, definitely it's not. So for each project, you have to, as I said many times, you have to modify it. You have to do your thinking first. But if you do so, I hope and I believe you will get the tool which is easy to use. It's not any rocket science, as you can see. Stage, gates, couple of metrics, and then you do your business and measure it. Mm -hmm. So potential issue that you have to overcome or barriers is the willingness of the team for measuring, to, for getting, collecting the data and typical questions. We've never done this, so why should we do it now? This question or similar question we have faced many times. Mm -hmm. So find your arguments why to do it, find the benefits presented with the team, and then that's it. Job done. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And this concludes today's lesson. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, enjoy the evening. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.